Hey, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. I wanted to set up this video. I asked my wife, Laura, to join me in the studio to have a chat about some of the personal and financial challenges that we've faced together as we've run 30 by 40 Design Workshop over the past 10 years. Now, Laura is not an employee of the business, but I couldn't have done any of this without her support, her guidance, and her financial buy-in, of course. And I think business and entrepreneurship oftentimes is glorified and you only see the bright, shiny aspects of it. But there are some behind the scenes challenges that everyone faces. And it can be easy to look at someone else's business and someone else's success and think they had it all architected out and planned from the beginning and that they faced no hurdles. And that's just not true. So I wanted to ask Laura to join me for this behind the scenes chat on lessons learned 10 years in. So rewinding back to early days, uh, right before I started 30 by 40, I had been telling you I was a little bit unhappy with my mm -hmm. professional situation. And we had talked a little bit about me starting a business and going off on my own, but that was always kind of this precious idea that I never really- Yeah, we didn't have a timeline. We didn't have a specific plan. All the advice I had heard was you have to save 12 to 18 months yeah. of revenue mm -hmm. and all of this money in the bank. It just didn't even seem possible. And we weren't really saving that much. And in fact, I think we were just enjoying the fact that the kids were out of daycare. We had some extra money and we had spent a lot of money on a vacation. When the time came that you quit your job, it wasn't quite planned. You know? It was a little bit unplanned. Uh, so we definitely financially went into it with very little saved and some credit card debt. And of course we had the mortgage. And so it was, um, you know, Thankfully, we already had, I had my job and we had benefit, health benefits through that. To set the stage though, the employer that I was working for previously had cut our pay by 20%. And so yeah. that gave the freedom to go off and look for supplemental income. Mm -hmm. Which we knew you could find, you did find. I did find some. Yeah, yeah. Everyone gets to this point where, you know, staying in the status quo, maintaining the status quo, staying in a painful situation, when that pain exceeds the pain of actually making <laughs> a change and going off and starting yeah. something new, yeah. that's the point when you're actually gonna make the change. I got to a very painful moment mm -hmm. and I just decided it's now or never. Cause you, you can plan the dream forever, but at some point you have to step into the dream and actually do the thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I have to be that person who does that. And I remember calling you on the phone the day that I gave notice. Do you remember that? Yeah, it, it, I mean, in some ways I wasn't surprised because I knew you were unhappy and I really was excited to hear that you were willing to take that risk because I, I, want, I knew you needed to make some kind of change. So it, it precipitated pretty quickly. I remember in that moment feeling as free as I've ever felt and, yeah. and, and this amazing feeling of empowerment. And then the next day getting up and I was just working in the house from the couch. Mm -hmm. I moved my drafting table up to the corner of the living room mm -hmm. and I, ha I was kind of filled with this sense of dread. Like, okay, now yeah. I actually have to build the plane that I'm flying in. Do you remember the exercises that we went through financially to do, to make it work? Well, yeah, we, ha we, went, we sat down and did a, our budget um, pretty in, in great detail because we were trying to figure out uh, what the minimum was we needed right. to live off of month to month. Uh, so we, we did come up with a, a, a minimum monthly income that we needed. And I think like we were just hoping to, to not lose the house. So it was like, <laughs> make all the bills. <laughs> well, not only not that, house. <laughs> not only that, but I didn't want to go back to working for someone else. Yeah. So I knew setting that gap between income and expenses getting that gap as narrow as possible so that it just felt like this minimum viable income that I had to produce um, felt motivating to me. You know, once we looked at what that mm -hmm. actual mm -hmm. gap was and, you know, for people who are doing this on their own um, without a partner, I was lucky mm -hmm. to have you, you had health insurance, you had a stable job. And for people who are going in this alone, saving a runway is probably necessary. You need yeah, some definitely. cash buffer. We did not have that at we the didn't. time. and. I have to say for me personally, I found it very motivating that I knew I had to make up that shortfall because I was determined not to go back mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. for someone else. And in some ways you just have to do it. And sometimes just the sheer pressure, financial pressure, and the fact that you like you've jumped off a cliff and now you're falling through the air. So you better do something. Sometimes that in and of itself is the motivation that you need to just do it um, because you, 
there's a lot of fear associated, I think, with doing something like this. And uh, fear can can be paralyzing yeah, right, um, for right. people. Um, we did this so, exercise called fear setting early on. I don't know if you remember that. It's the Tim Ferriss yes, exercise. Like, yeah. what's the worst possible thing yeah. that can happen? And I think the conclusion that a lot of people reach is, I have to go find another job. And, right. you know, it may even be a better job than the one that I have mm -hmm. presently. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's some freedom in that, you know, like yeah. nobody wants to fail at it starting a, a business. It is a really useful exercise. You're right. And I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're writing this stuff down, because once you write down all of the worst case scenarios and you look at them, it's like, okay, in the grand scheme of the things, this is not all that scary. Yeah. And if the yeah. business had been a complete flop and a failure, mm -hmm. it would still be a net positive. Yeah. I still had skills that I gained and mm -hmm. people that I met and experiences. You know, I think for anyone who looks at this and maybe did more planning than we were doing, it's never going to look like a great decision to walk away from a steady surefire paycheck and step into off a cliff into nothing. Well, yeah, because you're not just, it's not just yourself and your own happiness. It's also feeling res the responsibility of supporting a family and kids. Yeah. And for some people, it could be supporting parents or, or other loved ones. Uh, so you feel like you can't make all of your decision decisions just for yourself, but also the people around you want you want and need you to be happy and fulfilled. So for myself, I really wanted to see you happy as the number one thing. Um, and then we would make the finances work however we could. Yeah, if we made this decision purely based on the financial motivations, it, we never would have chosen no. to do this. <laughs> so if you do the math and you, and you say, well, you know, that a steady paycheck completely going away, it's going to hurt the budget. It's going to, yeah. it's going to feel like a big financial risk. Also, we were not thinking about the future future. You know, at that time we were not thinking about it was survival mode, saving for retirement. And yeah. it was literally month to month survival. And I yeah. felt motivated by the fact that I didn't want to be the dad who couldn't provide the vacation for his right. kids. Yeah. I didn't want to be the dad who failed in his business. Like I found those things very mm -hmm. personally motivating. And so having that some kind of financial edge, that I could brush up against and really work toward was motivating for me. Those first early jobs, I had some moonlighting projects that then transitioned to full-time work. I was undervaluing my services. Oh yeah. So totally. we did this budget Yeah. and the numbers weren't correct. No. <laughs> they were, I was underbilling. I was, you know, only planning on working part-time on these jobs. And so they were really small jobs. I worked through them quickly and the whole thing was, you know, as much as we tried to plan, I feel like it just was, it, it was an imperfect exercise. We were bound to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And what about the other things that you were experimenting with as products, building furniture and, and things like that? I think, um, you know, neither one of us really thought about, like, what's the cost benefit of this as a product? Like, how much time does it take right. for you to do this versus how much are you, how many of these will you sell? And um, neither of us had that kind of business background. So every time there was an idea about a cool product that you were making, I thought they were all pretty cool. So we were sort of like, yeah, let's do, you know, you should do that too. So there was actually like a, a, a lot of experiments happening all at once. Um, but in the end, I think that was an important thing to do. I mean, I think you have to do all of those experiments to figure out what works. One of the early sort of rubrics we put in place was as long as we made that gap in our budget, as long as we made that difference, we would take anything that was left over and we put it in a runway account. Yeah. And that business account just held that as a cash buffer. And over time that grew larger mm -hmm. and larger, but I never wanted to get to the point where I had to go back and search for another job, go back to work for somebody else. And what I did with that kind of white space, that buffer that was creating was run those experiments. Yeah. So like YouTube yeah. was an experiment that I ran. It was. And I ran it out of, financial motivation. I thought I could earn advertising. Yeah. Revenue. And but also I thought it became a creative outlet for you because you were always eventually. very interested in film and photography and the film part of it, I think picked up a lot because before that you had identified photography as something you really enjoyed and you were good at. I don't think that you had experimented a lot with film until no. you started playing around with YouTube no. and then it became a really driving creative um, outlet for you. The other thing that we weren't ready for, and, and this is where the, again, where the runway came in is the bumpy income. Right. That's it was right. very difficult to predict. Uh, and, and I think people who have had businesses or grew up in, in families where there were 
businesses, they're used to that idea, but you and I were not raised that way. Steady paycheck, it felt yeah, like, and like- not having a steady, steady paycheck was a very hard thing to adjust to for both of us. And, and so, plan, we, we like to plan generally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so having kind of like the runway was, was very, created space for you to experiment, but also created, I think there, there was space that you needed and you also needed to remove some of the anxiety Yes. about what the income was going to be. So having that runway also alleviated some of that so you could focus on being creative. Yeah. From a personal relationship standpoint, big change from me working in an office and having mm -hmm. a social circle there to me working in the house by myself. Yeah. I think, you know, I was spending my whole day interacting with people at work, you know, with my employees and my colleagues and a, a lot of intense interactions. And then I would come home just wanting to take a breather and you'd be like ready to talk about your day, like bounce ideas off of me. And I think sometimes it was, you know, probably on occasion I would stop paying attention and you probably felt like I was ignoring you. So that was one, one thing that we noticed. And another one was like, because you were working at home, you were just available. So like if when the kids were at, done with school at two thirty in the afternoon and they didn't have something after school, it was very natural for you to just, be like, oh, I'll go get them, you know? But then as that progressed, we quickly realized like, even though you're here and maybe your schedule was more flexible, we had to really try to keep everything 50, 50, um, because it was very easy for us to sort of drift into the zone where you were just dealing with everything that was happening in the middle of the day. If someone got sick at school, it fell to you to go get them because yeah. You were here. It's a big challenge working out of your living space. I had the drafting table in the corner. Mm -hmm. We had our couches right there. So, you know, moving between work and personal life, there is no, there boundary. no boundary. And yeah. if I had a difficult phone call or something with a client interaction, mm -hmm. I couldn't really leave it behind. There was no disconnect there. And it also meant that when I got up in the morning, I was staring work at them in the face mm -hmm. and I would just work all the time yeah. and I, I think that's a challenge for anybody building their own business yes. in, in their home or even I mean this studio is 17 paces away from our house but it's I spend close. almost as much time in here as I do yeah. in our house and so I, I think that's that that's a boundary that um, you know you were working pretty hard at that time too to try and make up for, the, for the budget shortfall yeah. that I was had created by starting the business so you were working a lot I was working a lot it felt like a season of life where we were really mm -hmm. investing a lot back into our professional development yeah I was traveling more for work too so but you sacrifice time with family mm -hmm. with kids you're not going down to visit your parents as much I think that we had some distance we did. Yes, and we, I felt like we spent a lot of time navigating our time or mm. trying to negotiate our negotiating time. Negotiating time, yeah. Um, yeah. That's true. And I and I think that's true for a lot of people where, you know, it's a family where there's kids that need to be taken care of. And so I hated the fact that we always felt like we were like negotiating who was going to do what. Because it was our It kids. felt like a chore. You know, right? like yeah. I didn't want it to feel that way, right. but it definitely both had different pressures and we were trying to balance all those things and still respect each other's time. And I don't think I really fully appreciated how hard it was to work out of the living room until COVID hit and I had to work out of the living room, yeah. <laughs> which was just a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I found it really difficult. I mean, first because the kitchen was right there and everybody else was home and they were coming in and making lunch while I was right. trying to focus. And um, I, I remember distinctly realizing like this is what it probably felt like when you were and even though you told me it really wasn't until I actually experienced it when I realized like how distracting even without people walking in it could be just being in that room yeah yeah so I remember a moment I had a client meeting at the kitchen at the dining table and yeah. we have a big open living space so kitchen dining living and my meeting space was the living rooms, which meant I had to clean the whole house before any you know new client was coming by for any meeting. But we also have a cat, and this cat is like the cat a cat that you didn't want is a terror. <laughs> and so during this prospective client meeting, I'm sitting at the dining table. The house is in pristine condition, you know. I'm all excited for this. I'm presenting my portfolio, and the cat climbs between the slip cover on the sofa and the the inside of it, and I couldn't extract the cat so he's like clawing his way <laughs> up this thing and this client is looking over at it I'm trying to extract the cat from it and this is someone who wants me you know to design a three million dollar house yeah. for him right and he's right. looking like sideways like is this the guy I'm gonna hire to do this I don't think so I mean imposter syndrome 
is real, but that's writ large. That's like, that's, yeah. I'm an amateur. Yeah. And if you're spending that much on an architect, you expect to be in a professional office space. That's right. <laughs> Not yeah. somebody's living room with their cat tearing apart the couch. Yeah. <laughs> so. Embarrassing, yeah. So maybe the beginning of the second phase was when we decided to take some of the money that the business had made and we built the studio with it. Yeah, we started taking the runway and investing using that, it. Yeah. using it to build this. Which also over. felt scary because we're like, okay, we're going to take all the <laughs> runway money and build a studio with it. What well, was a challenge to me because I thought, you know, if I can prove this passive income model yeah. for the business, you know, splitting the business between services and products, like this is the perfect experiment. And yeah. it's also ends up being a portfolio piece. You know, so many people ask, you know, if I don't have the perfect portfolio, how do I go and you know secure more projects like the dream projects that I yeah. want? And you know this is one way of doing that. By it's a great way actually too because yeah. you self fund it and then you're not paying rent, so you don't take on any overhead, and you have a beautiful office space that showcases your design skills. And there's no cat in it, and it looks very professional. And no <laughs> you don't have to worry about you know seeing clients in this space because it's dedicated to that. Yeah, I think phase two for me is characterized by like leaning into entrepreneurship, really thinking more about, more strategically about what I want this business to look like. The first phase, I had designed a business that looked like everybody else's. Every other employer that I had served clients one to one. And mm -hmm. I knew that having a whole huge stable of projects, that was super stressful, you know, and just the intrusions in our personal life, it became a lot. And so I think phase two was, okay, how do I design this to be more in the likeness of something that I want? At this point, we start building a longer runway than necessary because I still had that fear of, is this all gonna end tomorrow? Do you, do you remember that? I was like, yeah. this could go away yeah. next yeah. month. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I, like that idea that you're trading time for dollars. I mean, I think the early stages of the business definitely felt like that because that. it was like, just whatever you can do to get the business successful. Also, we both felt like amateurs in terms of taxes and all of the operational aspects of the business because neither of us were business majors or learned any of that, right? So, um, you know, that was a huge learning curve and a concern sometimes, at least that I felt like it would, it was good to have some kind of buffer in the bank because what if we were making a huge mistake with taxes or, right. or, or in budgeting, you know, the income for the business plus, and the expenses, are we really doing this right? Um, so that was also something that we struggled with. And I think other people probably do too, unless you happen to be, you know, really well educated on, you know, running a business already. Well, this was, you know, it's still that scarcity mindset that I had. Like I was still trying yeah, to build this true. runway yeah. bigger and bigger so that it's I, gonna go away. cause it's going to go away. Yeah. And it, in that sense, I didn't hire the professionals that I could have at mm -hmm. that point. I didn't hire people to help me do drawings. I didn't hire accountants. I was still doing it all. I was still wearing all the hats and mm -hmm. I thought this is still the best way to do it. Yeah. And, and you did that for quite a while. I mean, yeah. It's a huge mistake, you know, looking yeah. back and, you know, if I think I'm in phase three or maybe ending phase three, you know, that's something I've learned and I'm, I'm changing now. But, you know, as I think back to some of the, the personal frictions that happened in this second phase, you know, I'm comfortable I can put food on the table. Like I feel reasonably um, sh assured that I could do that. But, you know, work was starting to fill all the space. Mm -hmm. I was just letting it be everything yeah. that, and I would be out here uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting more projects and there were more projects that like, looked like the things that I wanted to be doing, it comes along with all of the liability issues. And you know, when you have, we have a big storm on the coast here, mm -hmm. I remember getting phone calls like, the windows are leaking, hey, let's have a yeah. chat, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you start to, you open this door and you go, these are all didn't think about the that. scary things that I didn't think about. And so I got, I remember getting really serious about contracts, about mm -hmm. insurance and about choosing better clients Yeah, because, you know, choosing the wrong client can have massive financial implications. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, more than once you and I made the decision to, you know, do we go on this vacation or do we bank this money just in case X happens? Yeah. And, I hadn't anticipated. Sometimes we didn't go on the vacation. We didn't. <laughs> yeah. And it's, that's a real, that's a concern that kept me up at night. I think I was pretty cavalier in the early phase mm -hmm. about insurance. Like, do I need insurance for doing a screen porch edition? Yeah. Or yeah. bathroom renovation? I don't, didn't feel as important, but. Did you also feel like, well, I mean, I'm not going to make mistakes like that. Right? Like, 
I know what I'm doing. You don't know what you I'm don't know. I'm not going to have to worry about that. That's yeah. the problem. And yeah. and there's all of these, you know, in this business, there are many things you can't control. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't control who the client ultimately hires to be the contractor. And that person can make some big mistakes and involve you through no fault of your own. Yeah. And I think learning to choose better clients and better projects was definitely an essential step in this phase. But then there was also a progression where you were thinking about moving away from client work altogether because you also had other types of, at that point, I think you had written your books and yeah. you became really interested in... Selling um, plan sets. Yeah, just teaching what you've been learning all along. I mean, each time you learned something, you thought, well, that maybe this is something that other people might find useful and then turning around and, and providing that for other people as a teacher um, through books and through the YouTube channel. So I think you know, that became uh, a, a, an, an important part of your business and an, an increasingly larger part of your business too, right? Yeah, for that sure. that phase. Yeah, and I, I think building this building became kind of the stage set for mm -hmm. that next phase of, of the business. And that was unexpected. I mean, I, I didn't architect that out. Like no. it wasn't my plan. I was seriously just playing on and earning advertising revenue from the videos and that was mm -hmm. it. But then, mm -hmm. And I think this is true for any creative experiment that you run, you start discovering something that you didn't realize was there, mm -hmm. you know, and I enjoyed teaching and sharing knowledge. If phase three is, is about saying no, you found product market fit, you know you can get clients in, like I get regular stream of new inquiries, yeah. I know I, I can pick any one of these projects and move forward with it and probably make mm -hmm. something really nice out of it. There's a Which also comes from confidence. There's right? a confidence yeah. that comes with that, but also I have a limited number of projects I'm ever going to do in my life. Mm -hmm. And so you have to you have to say no to the things that aren't the right fit and the good yeah. opportunity but for you. But you could never do that in the beginning. You can't do it in the beginning. Saying no <laughs> in the beginning is just silly because you don't even know, you don't have enough information yet. Even if you someone were to listen to you talk about what your business looks like in phase three, you wouldn't apply the same math to phase one. Can't, no. Yeah. And you know, phase one is also about finding what you like to do, what's a good what fit works. for your personality and you know by the time you get to phase three which was you know i characterize as the past couple of years mm -hmm. basically you have to say no because you, you just don't unless you want to scale and i i never had the intention to really scale but you know i think what i did carry into phase three especially early on was this scarcity mindset that i had in phase one you know what's going to get me to the next phase isn't what got me here right. and i had to kind of lose some of that and so thinking about income in the business and investing that in, in ways that free up my time, that buy back some of my time, you know, so that I can be more of the CEO in the business rather mm -hmm. than the CEO and the worker bee and mm -hmm. the person who's ordering things and sweeping the floors. And I'm just seeing the benefits of, of investing in the business because things have, I mean, changed pretty significantly this past year and hiring different agencies to help me with things that I'm not best positioned for. Although even when you were thinking about hiring, <laughs> yeah. We still spent quite a lot of time talking about it and, okay, how much is this really going to cost? And, you know, at what point are we going to know? How are we going to know if it's working or not? Like, how long will we give it? We're, we, I remember having a lot of conversations like that. And, um, you know, so even though we're saying it was more comfortable, it didn't go without some you extensive still have conversations that, that about process in place. About so we can't risk. lose that. Yeah, can I we? know. There's also, um, I don't know if you feel like this because you, have your own lab you're running mm -hmm. a small business yourself um you get to the point doing 10 years anything doing anything for 10 years mm -hmm. and you feel like is there more like am i doing the right thing yeah so what else can i do right there's yeah. there's this process of uh, you know reinvention like what's next where do i take this do do what do i scale it do i sell it i have some of those cravings of wanting that phase one stuff again, where you have all this excitement, this energy, the uncertainty yeah. of that. There's the shiny a, objects. <laughs> yeah, there's an, there's yeah. an appeal to that, right? Because yeah. it's something new. And I think the older you get, the more entrenched in your ways and your ideologies and, and ways of working and thinking. And that just becomes stale after a while, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I mean, I look at some of the videos that I make, I'm like, oh, it's, that's the same video. You know, yeah. I got to do something new. You know, it's. And do you feel that way about your? Position? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I do. And um, I, I don't have a solution or a piece of advice necessarily, except that like you only you have a limited time. And I mean, I, I can think of 
other times in my career anyway where I have accept, I have taken on risk to change various aspects of my research program, um, saying yes and no to different things. And I'm definitely more likely now to say no than I was before. I mean, I went through that phase of saying yes to everything too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I learned that people make things look prestigious so that you will say yes. And really it just ends up being a lot of work. <laughs> it's really just a screen porch it's project, like, yeah. Wait a minute, I thought this was something prestigious. Yeah. Um, Comes so, along with a title. Right? So you see those things right away because it's like the first thing that people will say to you to kind of get you to do it. Like, wow, we have this great opportunity for you. And it's like, okay, you, it's a, you think it's a great opportunity for me, but that's my decision to make. Um, we're both turned 50 this year, you know? Uh, it's common to start looking at, okay, well, what can I do next? The more I build this business, the more time I spend out here. <laughs> we still spend a lot of time talking about it too. Right? It yeah. takes up a lot of the oxygen in the room. But also, it feel it, it's yours. It's uniquely yours because it's your business and you own all of the successes just as much as you own all the failures. So I think that's a, you know, those are positives and negatives, are, but I think, yeah. I think <laughs> owning the successes thing. feels a lot better than the successes you earn for an institution or for someone else. Mm. So whatever that success looks like, I think you, you give your, you're buying yourself freedom with that and confidence and, you know, less fear. So you're more willing to take more risks. And to me, that's real growth. I mean, I, th I think the, the positives and negatives, if we're looking at the two sides of this, you know, the positive is that you can be the CEO and direct, right? You're in a lab, mm -hmm. you're not doing a lot of wet bench work anymore. The business that I create for myself, I'm mm -hmm. the CEO, but I'm also the worker bee. So I'm also acting as the employee. So there's positive and negative to that, you know, and I made that conscious yeah. choice to not hire out for that. But, you know, I think that- You have to shut that off in other parts of your life. You know, like I have to sure. sometimes remember, like when I'm home, still have to clean. I'm not telling everybody what to do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you think I am, <laughs> but that's not my role. So you have to really like reset your mind in the yeah. other parts of your life where you're not in control. Yeah. The financial upside. Huge is, financial upside. Is infinite. It's amazing. It's infinite. It's, and it's not something I ever anticipated for yeah. us, and I'm I feel so grateful. And the, the financial downside is scary and significant. You know, there's lawsuits, there's lumpy income, there's yeah. uncertainty about- There it. will be failure yeah. for sure. And Not it, just financially, but you'll have a lot of failed experiments. Yeah, so that's true. just assume, take on that persona of a person who just get used to failing often because you will um, and be resilient. Yeah. I mean, uncertainty can be motivating and exciting, and it can also be stressful. There is this symbiosis that comes along with yeah. those things. Yeah. You know, with great financial reward, there's also great financial risk. Yeah. And I, one of the things that people always come to me asking is like, well, you know, tell me exactly how you did it, and I'm going to follow exactly those steps, and I want you to look at my personal situation and say to me, it's going to work for you. And I always push back and say, it's like, it's just unknowable. Yeah. You know, even if you were to follow the exact same steps, it's, it is risk. Mm -hmm. And um, all financial reward is derived from risk. And, and you you're know, never going to remove all the negatives. There's always going to be something. That's true. This doesn't happen without the support of my spouse and my family. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of personal sacrifice made to make this happen. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful. Well, I'm, I mean, you <laughs> sacrificed for, for my career too. So I think we just try to support each other and it takes a lot of communication. Um, but I think we've always tried to communicate fairly and tried to treat each other like equals. So I think that's been really successful for us and I, I, I would do it again in a second. So I know it's easy for me to say. Yeah, easy for you to say. <laughs> It's like you don't yeah. want to go through all the, the ups and downs. On that note, I'll be at work. I'll see you, <laughs> later. <laughs> you have to go through all the trials and tribulations to get to the end point. But yeah. uh, do you want to redo it? <laughs>